everything that we are that distinguishes us from chimps emerges from that 1% difference in DNA. It has to, because that's the difference. The Hubble telescope, these grand, that's in that 1%. Maybe everything that we are that is not the chimp is not as smart compared to the chimp as we tell ourselves it is. Maybe the difference between constructing and launching a Hubble telescope and a chimp combining two finger motions as sign language, maybe that difference is not all that great. We tell ourselves it is, just the same way we label our books optical illusions. We tell ourselves it's a lot, maybe it's almost nothing. How would we decide that? Imagine another life form that's 1% different from us in the direction that we are different from the chimp. Think about that. We got 1% difference and we're building the Hubble telescope. Go, one, go another 1%. Who, what are we to they? We would be drooling, blithering idiots in their presence. That's what we would be. We would, they would take Stephen Hawking and roll him in front of their, their primate researchers and say, well, this one is like the most brilliant among them because he can do sort of astrophysics in his head. Oh, isn't that cute? Little Johnny can do that too. Oh, that's so nice. Oh, in fact, Johnny just did that. Let me get it, it's, it's, it's on the refrigerator door. Here he is. He did it in his elementary school class. Think about how smart they would be. Quantum mechanics would be intuitive to their toddlers. Whole symphonies would be written by their children and like I said, just put up on the refrigerator door the way our pasta collages are on our refrigerator doors. <laughs> so the notion that we're gonna find some intelligent life and have a conversation with it? <laughs> when was the last time you stopped to have a conversation with a worm? <laughs> Or bird. Oh, well, you might have had a conversation, but I don't think you expected an answer, all right? <laughs> so, we don't have conversations with any other species on Earth with whom we have DNA in common. To believe that some intelligent other species is going to be interested in us enough to have a conversation? They'll look at our Hubble telescope and say, oh, isn't that quaint? Look at what they're doing. So, I lay awake at nights wondering whether simply we as a species are simply too stupid to figure out the universe that we're investigating. And maybe we need some other species, 1%, 1% smarter than we are, for which strength theory would be intuitive, for which all the greatest mysteries of the universe, from dark matter, dark energy, the origins of life, and all the frontiers of our thought would be something that they would just self-intuit. I'm jealous of that possibility because I want to be around for those discoveries. Thank you all. So I was in Virginia. There was the small black and white TV and there were the first fuzzy images of Neil Armstrong taking his first steps on the moon. The moon. You know? The moon is up there. But where do, how does it, you know, you, you go through this sort of existential uh, are they really up there? Because you can see the moon. It's not something hidden. You didn't need special apparatus to know that the moon is up there. It's there. And I remember thinking distinctly, oh, first moon landing. Be the beginning of a whole new era. And I'm sure I was not alone with those thoughts. But because I was certain, as was everyone else, that it was the beginning of an era, I didn't I, I didn't jump for joy or do somersaults. I just said, it's the beginning. So there we were anticipating the moon landing. Then you watch the moon landing. And then you reflect on the moon landing. And as time moved on, 
it never kept happening. It was just there, now receding in the past. And had I known that our first steps on the moon would essentially be our last steps on the moon, I would have, I would have done somersaults. <laughs> I would have said, oh my gosh, this is a unique moment in the history of our species. Uh, never to happen again, let me revel and celebrate and pop champagne corks. Um, I would have felt differently had I known that that was the beginning of the end rather than the beginning of the beginning. Well, get me started. Yeah, you don't want to get him started. <laughs> I, mean, I, I know that from experience. How do you know that math is the language of the universe? I was going to say, what I, the multi? The universe told me. <laughs> 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 okay. okay. One day far in the future, we encounter some alien civilization, and they say, hey, show us what you've done to understand the universe, and we bring out our math books with all our theorems and physics, and they turn to them and say, math, we tried that. Yeah, <laughs> it, it takes you just so far. <laughs> <laughs> and the real way to do it is like this. But, 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 no, but I'll, I'll, here, I want to I wanna, I wanna have a no it. It's just because, wait, it's just because... You still can't figure Just out your big theory. Back in don't come crying to me. Don't come crying to me. me. You can't figure it out. Well, in fact, you got him started. See, you got him started. I said, don't get me started. Don't get him started. <laughs> no, but I want. But it is a question. There may be limitations yep. in understanding the universe because of the way our brains work, and I think. That's uh, surely the and, case. That's yeah, surely the and, case. And for Republicans, it's already happened. But it's uh, a. <laughs> But, 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 um, what I wonder, Richard, is whether there really is no such thing as consciousness at all, and that there's some other understanding of the functioning of the human brain that renders that question obsolete. To that, I gotta say, like, oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. And am I am I like thinking, or am I just like thinking that I'm thinking? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Will you Richard, stop? Oh, right, right, right. That's uh, too expensive. Send robots. Yet they. I said, why? Well, how did you get interested in space? Oh, because of the Apollo program. And I slap them. I'm saying, what are you? <clears throat> No, that's it. <laughs> no, there was on, on the other on the other hand, on the other hand, if you for, if you remember it's the last three. No, that's, that's delusional, and I'll tell you why. It's not it's not incorrect. That's the facts. No, 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 no. You can argue with the facts. I right, watch me. Okay. okay. <laughs> so so I I, I I'm sorry. I, Everybody like mentioned their book. It's time for me to mention my latest book. It's I don't think anyone mentioned their book actually. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> what you just said is a complete delusion. It presumes that we went to the moon for science. It no. presumes that we went to the moon to explore it. But that's not why we went no. to the moon. We no, went to brother the moon. Neil. No, it is not. <laughs> no, it is not. <laughs> we went to the moon because we were at war. Sputnik was not just some orbiting spacecraft. It was a hollowed out intercontinental ballistic missile. Bridge that gap a little bit. I'm going to be uh, silent. Uh, um, no, you're not. <laughs> um, but uh, th I think it's really important to point, to point out that this is a political issue. And in fact, I, 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 me and Buzz Aldrin together so testified before the House Sec Science Committee on Space Exploration. And I, uh, when I said that that humans don't do science in space. I didn't argue, in fact, even before the committee, that we shouldn't send humans into space. We should just say well, honestly why we're doing it. We're doing it for adventure. That's why we're doing it. No, and that's honest, not what funded hold it. Hold on, hold on. No, that's, that's not true. See, you said no, you wouldn't talk. But, yeah, I did but, say that. Okay, okay. You can say that. No, no, hold on. No, there's, there's no there there, okay? <laughs> there, no, just, just, 
Just look at the history of everybody no, no. doing big projects, and it's never driven by exploration. It's never driven by science. It's never driven by curiosity. Not if it's big and expensive. It's driven by the fact that people don't want to die. So there's a war driver. It's also driven by the fact that people want to get wealthy. So no, no, hold money. on. We have the Large Hadron Collider. The Large Hadron Collider. The Large Hadron Collider. The large, do, you, do you know? Oh, no. No. <laughs> This proves my point. Yeah, yeah, the Large Hadron Collider. <laughs> uh, please remind me of the total construction cost of the Large Hadron Collider. I don't know about ten billion. About ten billion. That is six months of NASA funding. So you call that big budget? Not here in America. It's not. Yeah, NASA's budget's about seventeen billion. Doesn't go as far as it used to. No. So, so it's expensive, but not on the scale that we're talking about here. Okay, the country shared that. That's, that's not big money. Okay. Big okay. money is a shuttle mission costs a billion dollars here. One I'm not saying half. it should cost that, but that's One what it half. does. And what, who, who writes those checks? It's people who do it for geopolitical reasons. Not because they care about science. Our super collider, the one that you would have benefited from, the, sup the superconducting super collider, <coughs> started to get funding in the 1980s. Wasn't it? Yeah. 200 mile ring? It would have been. No, it would 60, 60 mile ring. 60 mile that much of the circumference. 60, 60 miles around, yeah. I thought it was 60 times. Well, take pie. it from me, it's 60. Pie? No, no, it's 60. Okay. It's better I'm story with 200, miles? though. Brian, 60. 60. Circumference? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay, I've been saying it wrong all these years. Well, like never mind. Of, thank you. Never yeah. mind. Okay, no. So watch, watch. So here's a super collider. We. America would have found the Higgs boson decades ago. Actually, I, Tracy, I think I want to uh, direct this one to you. Um, Who's you? To Tracy. Um, that's, that's, <laughs> not, that's not Neil. I'll be happy. Okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, it says here, science has recently become somewhat trendy. Often the focus is not actually on the science, but making entertainment out of science. Is this ultimately good for science, do you think? I only uh, want I to, I, to answer that question. Mm -hmm. All you have to look at is what is going on in this stage tonight. This is entertainment. I hope so. This is absolute entertainment. I'm sitting here just watching. I'm, I'm ducking out of the way sometimes. <laughs> but I'm sitting here watching, and it's making a point about science and how to convey and how to make science interesting to the public. You're getting into these. This is this I, is. I, yeah, I agree. This is how to do it. Did you? Did you I think fun and entertainment are overrated. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's because you're British. That's because you're British. So you no, know. no, it's okay. <laughs> People are more alike than they are just. <laughs> Science is hard, but it's worth it. It's fascinating. It's enthralling. But if we only talk about the bits that are fun and make bangs and smells and things, then we, we don't do science justice. I, I was once, um, I mean, uh, the, we, we use the phrase dumbing down, and, and we, mustn't, we mustn't do that. Um, I, I once gave a speech at a, at a British conference um, ab about the uh, public um, communication of science, and I was r ranting against dumbing down. And at the end, some, some man got up and said, this is not an exaggeration, this is a true story. He said, maybe we need dumbing down in order to bring women and minorities into science. Oh, no. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to get there. Um, I read a book, Constellation of Philosophy. The main guy, Boethius, is condemned to death. He has everything taken from him. All he has is his reason and his sense of self. Not even that. But... He attempts to console himself to this execution by reasoning that the world has order, that there is something that keeps things together. And he uses his reason to try and get to the root of why he should be at peace at death. The problem is, his source of origin is a belief in God. What would you do? Well, I, I don't know if I fully understand the question. I do know that uh, if he's about to be executed, 
How about you are about to be executed? Oh, I'm about to be executed. You have nothing except your knowledge and your your knowledge of science, your experience. I would request that my body in death be buried, not cremated, so that the energy content contained within it gets returned to the earth so that flora and fauna can dine upon it just as I have dined upon flora and fauna throughout my life. Okay, so maybe you did see visitors from another part of the galaxy. I need more than your eyewitness testimony. And in modern times, I need more than your photograph, which Photoshop probably has a UFO button today. Like, <laughs> stick it in, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> on your computer. So, here's, the, here's, the, here's what you do. I'm not saying we haven't been visited. I'm saying the evidence thus far brought forth does not satisfy the standards of evidence that any scientist would require for any other claim that you're going to walk into the lab with. So here's what I recommend. Here's what I recommend. Next time you're abducted, because I'm ready for this. I'm ready. Okay? I get abducted. I'm ready. Okay? So you're there. You're like on the slab, because they always do like the sex experiments on you, on the flying saucer. So there you are, and they're poking at you. So here's what you do. You ready? You tell the alien, you'll be alien for this, right? So you're poking me. All right. So then Finally, I say, I'm on this side of the equation. Okay. So I say, hey, look over there. And then he looks over there. You quickly like snatch something off the shelf, put it in a pocket, and then lay back. All right. <laughs> then, then you're done. You come back. He say, look what I got. Okay. I like stole the ashtray off the shelf of the flying saucer. And then you bring that to the lab. And it's not about eyewitness testimony at that point, because you'll have something of alien manufacture. And anything you pull off of a flying saucer that crossed the galaxy is going to be interesting. Okay? <laughs> because even objects within our own culture. I got this a device here. Okay? The iPhone. Ten years ago, they would have resurrected the witch-burning laws had you pulled this thing out, okay? <laughs> and that's in our own culture. The fact that you take a circle of any size, a circle the size of the universe itself, and divide it by its own radius, and you get that number, that's beautiful. I have to pause, and I, I get misty thinking of this. <laughs> it's just another one. Another one, that the atoms and molecules in your body are traceable to the crucibles in the centers of stars that manufacture these elements over its lifespan when unstable on death, exploding its enriched guts across the galaxy, scattering it into gas clouds that would ultimately collapse and make a star and have the right ingredients to make planets and people. Which means we are part of this universe as I've said many times, and this is, goes back, the, the, not only are we in the universe, the universe is in us. That is a profound concept. And it was, I think it's the greatest gift that astrophysics gave culture in the 20th century. And when you look at law, law is, well, what happens in the courtroom? It doesn't go to what's right. It goes to who argues best. And there's this urge, there's the, whole, the entire profession is founded on right. who the best arguers are. Right. It's not a courtroom is not about the truth. It's about that they that the theory. I, I if I get what you're saying is that everybody are each side argues their version and then the truth somehow emerges. That's the premise. However, the right. the practice, which for example is bred in debating teams, for example, where right. you know the subject, but you don't know what side you're going to put be put on to argue. Right. And so the act of arguing and not agreeing seems to be fundamental to that profession and Congress is half that profession. And I, 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 I realized this when I was a kid, I was 12 and I said, oh, I wonder what profession all these sen senators and Congress were. Law, 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 businessman, law, law. And I said, there are no scientists, we're the engineers. Where's the rest of life represented here? And so, so when I look at the conflicts the argumentative conflicts. I just sit back and say, you know, can I buy an engineer, please, or sign, put somebody, a, a business, a, 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 a business person who knows how to make a hard but 
uh, but but a significant financial decision because at the end of the day they got to make the but the the books work. But you know, I I, I think that that is part I'm, of I'm it. Screaming, I, I'm sorry. It's okay. I, I like. <laughs> But with fear of numbers, this one freaks me out every time I walk into an elevator and it's 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 14. <laughs> I did the experiment. 80% of all buildings along Broadway in New York City do not have a 13th floor. This is the United States of America. And we have people afraid of the number 13. <laughs> in those buildings, what I want to do is carry a sharpie and cross off the 14th. Yeah. <laughs> so like, that's the 13th floor, you're not fooling anybody. You know what else we're afraid of? We're afraid of like negative numbers. What happens when you get to the lobby and the floor below that is like B for like basement? Yeah. And then what's below that? S B for like sub basement. <laughs> now, now we need some more consonants. We then go below that. SSB. <laughs> so there's a perfectly good arithmetic way to accomplish this with all negative numbers. Yes. But that scares Americans. You know who it does not scare? Germans. Okay? <laughs> this is a museum in Germany. It's not even a science museum. It's a history museum, and you're looking at four negative one. You can't notice it? There it is. A little bigger for you. What country do we still associate with having some of the finest engineers in the world? Germany, Germany of course. Then there's like, there's a math problem going on, okay? Congressman, uttering the following sentence. I've changed my views <laughs> to the United States. the congressman made a math error, or maybe the congressman knew what he was saying, <laughs> and was secretly not changing his views at all. I don't know what's scary. Here's what we can the do. The Florida Keys are supposed to have disappeared by now. Okay, you know, we have a house there. Here's what we could do. Uh, here's what we could do. Okay. Uh, by, by the way, I think uh, conserving the environment is, a, is conservative. Right? Isn't that yeah. what conservation but means? Is we all conservative? agree. I just, I just thought. I just. But, 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 uh, what, what, what you can do is, we can take everyone who denies the the the, no. the consensus yeah. of of the. Okay. okay. Science doesn't operate. Sure. On if you want to say, say you know it. Well, science doesn't operate on consensus. No. Well, science operates as the. Well, well, no, no, it, 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 it operates on a consensus of experiments. No, no, no. There are tipping points. You know where every where everyone. You know, at first they didn't all believe in evolution, and then 50 years later, yes, right. the consensus was it was true, and now we move on to the next thing. Are well, you prepared to put your money? Where your ideas are. Absolutely. Okay, so then you're so you're prepared. So here's the experiment. You take all the scientists yep. who authored these papers, get them to pool their money, and invest in companies that would benefit from global warming. And take all the people who are in denial of global warming, take all their money, invest in companies that would presume there is no global warming. And I predict, you want a prediction? I predict that you will all go broke in the next fifty years. And I will predict exactly the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm not very hero-driven or role-model-driven. In fact, I think role-model is overrated. In fact, I think it's a bad concept. Typically, a role-model is someone who resembles your profile in some fundamental way, and you want to follow their steps to become what they are. Okay, so there I am at age 11 in 1969, and I'm going to find a black astrophysicist who grew up in the Bronx. No, there aren't any. So am I going to limit my options in life because maybe I'm going to do something where I'm the first? No. The problem with role models today is you have these athletic role models and then they, they have steroids or drugs or whatever. And then the people who put them up as role models, they worry that the kids who saw them as role models now want to do drugs. That's just, it's, no. No, if you like their athletics, like their athletics. Carve that out and put it there and reach for that. Don't be the rest of what they are. Who knows what the rest of what they are is? Be high, and I'll tell you why. People say, well, have you found life yet? No, well, there, you know. 
that's like going to the ocean, as has been said before, and taking a cup of water, scooping up, and saying, there are no whales in the ocean, you know? <laughs> Here's my data, you know? <laughs> you, you need a slightly bigger sample. And so if you look at, for example, what we call the radio bubble, this is the sphere around Earth, centered on Earth, which is the farthest our radio signals have reached in the galaxy. And they're about 70 light years away. We've been transmitting radio signals inadvertently leaking into space for about 70 years. 70 light year radius sphere. Well, how big is the galaxy? Well, shrink that sphere down to maybe the size of a BB, and then the galaxy on that scale would be the size of this stage. That's how far our radio signals have traveled. And those aren't even the ones we sent on purpose. The ones we sent on purpose have traveled much less. So no, we haven't actually um, reached as far into the galaxy as we'd like before we would say definitively that there's no one intelligent living today. Well, biologists would finally have another example of life, rather than pretending that they have actual biodiversity here on Earth, when all life they've ever studied has DNA in common with one another. Does life need liquid water? Does life have metabolism? Does life need this? Is, is, is a virus alive? Is, is crystal alive? They're asking these questions because they don't have seven examples of life. So if you had, no, I'm one? talking. If you had seven examples of life, you could say, here's what they all have in common. And this that uses liquid methane, it uses liquid water. So liquid water is not important. It's just that it has a liquid. Or what if they all have liquid water? Then you got good argument. If they all have DNA, now you can talk about what life is and what's so not. That's, the that's all I'm saying. And so he comes up with the phrase, a brilliant phrase, in a letter to a friend of his. He said, apparently, the Bible tells you how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. <laughs> so he, he drew the first line in the sand between how you might relate to your religion if you're going to live in a physical reality. I don't grow up and only ever talk about the universe. Well, so let's talk about that. You have a, a huge appetite for being intellectually curious. Oh, yeah. Where did that come from? I, well, it, it's, it is contained within any adult who has not grown up. So you're still a big child. I'm still a kid. And I think that's true for most, if not every single person who carries scientists as a title. Because what does a kid do? A kid turns over rocks and explores and pokes things. And it takes foresight for an adult to allow that, recognizing that these explorations that usually end up in stuff that's broken are actually experiments on the forces of nature that surround us. Kids don't worry about the weather. Oh, it's raining. Let's go out and get wet. No, you'll get your clothes dirty. Well, there's a mud puddle there. Let me jump into it with two feet. No, everything is a no. Every time it's snowing outside, now I have to remind myself, but I do open my mouth and catch snowflakes in it. Just like kids. I, it's a reminder of what I don't want to lose as I get older. Because that is an inherent state of curiosity that I think we're born with. And just get it beaten out of us because it's not mature to jump two feet into the puddle. So what happened was, when science discovers things, and you want to stay religious, or you want to continue to believe that the Bible is unerring, what you would do is, you would say, well, let me go back to the Bible and reinterpret it. Then you say things like, oh, they didn't really mean that literally, they meant that figuratively. So this whole sort of reinterpretation of the fig how figurative the poetic passages of the Bible are, came after science showed that this is not how things unfolded. And so the educated religious people are perfectly fine with that. It's the fundamentalists who want to say that the Bible is the literally, literal truth of God, that, and want to see the Bible as a science textbook, who are knocking on the science doors of the school, trying to put that content in the science. Uh, enlightened religious people are not behaving that way. They're saying, yeah, science is cool, we're good with that. And use the Bible for, to get your spiritual enlightenment and your emotional fulfillment.
he paints this. It's called The Starry Night. It is the first painting I know of where the background is the subject of the painting. And that background is the night sky. And it is it is elevated the cosmos to become fair game to the artist. And I submit to you that science, scientific discovery, especially cosmic discovery, does not become mainstream until the artists embrace the fruits of those discoveries. Uh, let's see, I think a neighbor of yours, uh, is, he's a neighbor, right? Isn't he? He's like, you see him around town, I presume? Not, okay. <laughs> Uh, his his wealth, net worth is like $50 billion, plus or minus. I don't know if you know how much that is. I, I don't believe you know. You don't. In fact, I'm certain you don't, because I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you how rich this man is. First of all, it's I'm, I'm charmed by the fact that the patron saint of geeks is the richest man in the world. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a different world than it was when the richest people were sort of oil barons and steel barons. It's like a geek is the richest guy in the world. That's kind of cool. But 50 bill, I, I did this math because I walk along the street. You know, I, I have a job and I own a home and I'm walking down the street and I see a coin in the street. My question to myself is, what is the smallest denomination coin that I'll bend down and pick up, okay? <laughs> given the fact that I have a job, I own a home. So, the penny is staying, I'm not getting the penny. The nickel, no, nah, I'm not getting the nickel. Dime, if I'm not in a hurry, I'm picking up the dime, okay? A quarter, well that's good for parking meters and laundry, plus it's a quarter, right? So I'm picking up the quarter. So for me, the boundary between picking up the coin and not is between a dime and a quarter. So I figured, let me ratio this up to that wealth and ask how much money has to be laying in the street for Bill Gates to be too busy to pick it up. It's $45,000, okay? That's what it is. $45,000, I said, too busy. Somebody else get that. I'm, I got called the Andromeda Galaxy. It's, it happens to be among the stars of the constellation Andromeda. That fuzzy spiral contains 400 billion stars. These other stars you see in the picture are sitting on our nose in our own Milky Way. It's as though we're looking past a screen door through the void of intergalactic space to another galaxy. If you pull out the power of the Hubble Space Telescope and say, I'm not gonna look at this big galaxy, I wanna look at an uninteresting corner of the dark night sky and show me what's there, this is what shows up. This image has three stars in it that happen to be sitting on our nose. One of them, if you can still see me, is right here. They have spikes. Another one is directly over me here, and there's one at the top. Every other smudge, every other shape in this image is an entire galaxy from nearby to the distant universe. Every single splotch on this image. This is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. That's what it's called. And you sit here and gaze upon it and recognize that every smudge is like our own Milky Way, containing hundreds of billions of stars, some of which are forging these heavy elements that comprise life, exploding, scattering themselves into their own galaxies. And it is this knowledge that we have of the universe and our knowledge that we have of chemistry and our knowledge that we have of biology that allows us to derive the conclusion that no, we are not apart and separate from this universe, we are one with it. I can say one better than that. Not only are we one with it, because these elements are forged in the universe and they become part of life as we know it. It's not simply the fact that we are in the universe, 
But, ladies and gentlemen, the universe is in us. And I know of no more profound understanding or revelation that modern science can deliver but that. And for me, that makes me feel large, not small. Thank you all for this evening.